Okay, let's call the uh, regular meeting of the study session of the Planning Commission for the City of San Clemente, California's Wednesday, September 22nd, uh, 2021 meeting to order. Uh, Adam, would you please call roll? Yes, uh, Commissioner Camp. Here. Commissioner Cosgrove. I do not see him. Uh, Commissioner McCacken. Here. Commissioner Prescott Leffler. Here. Chair Pro Tem McCann. Here. Vice Chair Tyler. And I do not see her. And Chair Crandall. Here. So we have um, five of the seven uh, here at the moment. Um, we have one presentation this uh, evening um, historic preservation training. Um, Adam Atamian will be starting out, and then um, Audrey von Ahrens will be uh, following with the presentation. So Adam, would you take over? Yes, thank you, Chair Crandall. I am getting my PowerPoint up. I can find it. Okay, can everybody see that? Uh, yes. The slides, perfect. Okay, well, uh, good evening, Planning Commission. Um, tonight's item is related to historic preservation training. Uh, we are joined tonight uh, by Audrey uh, Von Ahrens. Uh, she is an Associate Architectural Historian at GPA Consulting. Um, and she will be covering uh, the Secretary of the Interior Standards and uh, what it means uh, for the city of San Clemente uh, to be a certified local government. Uh, but before she does, I wanted to cover a few items um, related to the, um, the, the city's um, previous uh, historical uh, historic preservation efforts and our, what our current general plan uh, covers. So I'm gonna try to, there we go. Uh, so I just went over that. Okay, so the city of San Clemente was incorporated in 1928. There was um, a, uh, an initial architectural style that was required um, uh, uh, for uh, construction in the city. And that was Spanish colonial revival architecture uh, to build uh, towards the envisioned theme of San Clemente as a Spanish village by the sea. Uh, due to a, a number of circumstances, there uh, was a loss of the um, Hanson, the Ole Hanson era buildings. Um, and in beginning in the 1980s, there was a real effort to uh, uh, preserve the um, historical uh, architectural style. And um, in the general plan of 1993, there was a path that was set out for a historic preservation program. Uh, in 1996, the city was, um, was uh, obtained certified local government status. Um, Audrey will cover that in more detail. Additionally, um, in 2006, uh, San Clemente obtained federal recognition as a Preserve America City, um, which uh, whereas the certified local government status is uh, a state a, a state level um, identification, the um, Preserve America City is a federal recognition. Okay, so. From the 1993 general plan update, um, some of the uh, some of the work that really came out of that that historic preservation program was a list of designated historic structures uh, and landmarks uh, within the city, the development of a cultural heritage subcommittee, uh, and this subcommittee uh, we've we've uh, discussed in in 
um, a little bit in a previous study session. It is the design review subcommittee. However, it applies when the design review subcommittee is reviewing projects um, related to uh, historic, historically designated resources. Uh, the city also embarked on a Mills Act program. Um, there, uh, the, the Planning Commission has recently reviewed uh, a, pro a project um, uh, related to a, a, a Mills Act property. Um, and then we also have uh, certain permits um, that fall under a, uh, a cultural heritage permit category uh, that are related to projects that affect historic resources or um, that are uh, um, within a certain proximity of a historic property. So in 2014, the city's centennial general plan was adopted. And in this general plan, one of the elements or chapters of the general plan is a historic preservation uh, element. And the primary goal of the historic preservation element is to preserve, rehabilitate, restore, and adaptively reuse buildings, features, sites, and districts with archeological, historical, architectural, or cultural significance to San Clemente. Uh, the element uh, further identifies some secondary goals, which I I've, I've have here, um, but it then goes much further into, uh, into identifying um, some specific areas where there are even more specific goals. And ultimately uh, what we end up is a, a series of policies for, um, for what the city uh, wants uh, to see as far as our, our historic preservation um, program is concerned. So there are the sections within this element uh, that um, are um, where there are policies provided are heritage promotion, historic preservation standards and regulations, preservation incentives, historic preservation for economic development, and historic preservation implementation measures. The implementation measures are really the, the, uh, the actionable version of the general plan policies. Um, these are all uh, available in the city's general plan. And I, I would recommend that the uh, planning commission as well as any members of the public interested in our historic preservation um, program to, uh, to review this, this element. It's got a lot of great information um, in it. As, as related specifically to tonight's study session, um, there, uh, the reason we care about certified local government and the Secretary of Interior standards is because the general plan tells us that the city uh, wants to, uh, to, uh, to promote uh, the, these, um, these aspects of historic preservation. So uh, the policies that are listed here uh, are, are good examples of, of policies that the, 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 uh, the city uh, th uh, through the uh, implementation of the general plan have told city staff that these are, these are things that, that, um, that we, 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 are, we are, are required to do. Um, as far as our historic preservation program is concerned. Uh, so with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end my portion and turn it over to Audrey so that she has as much time uh, to go over uh, in depth the, uh, the topics that she will be covering. Um, and Audrey, are you able to share your screen at this time? I am muted, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Adam, I appreciate that. Uh, I just wanna turn my video on just to introduce myself. So as Adam said, uh, I am a uh, historic preservation consultant with GPA Consulting. Um, and the city has asked me to be here today to give a refresher of the Secretary of Interior Standards. Um, and then we'll end uh, with a discussion of what it means to be a certified local government. Um, and. I am going to let you know before I even start, I'm in downtown Los Angeles. Unfortunately, um, 
sirens are a thing. Um, so please stop me uh, at any point if it gets too loud and I need to pause um, in case you can't hear me over <laughs> the background noise. Um, and I'm going to turn my video off while I share the screen um, just to make sure my internet stays strong throughout the presentation. Okay, and can you just confirm that you see the presentation? Yes, we see it. Excellent, thank you. And uh, the sound is okay? Sound is good. Sounds right. good. Excellent, thank you. Um, so as I said, we are going to be covering um, the Secretary of the Interior Standards and move into uh, the CLG program. Uh, but first, uh, the standards. And let's see. Okay. Um, so their full, their full title is the Secretary of Interior Standards for the Treatment of Historic Properties, which is quite a mouthful as I just stumbled there. Uh, so we often refer to them as the standards or SOIS for short. Um, the standards were initially published in 1977 by the Department of the Interior as guiding principles for the treatment of historic properties and are the product of numerous preservation efforts undertaken in the 60s and 70s in response to widespread redevelopment and infrastructure projects. So similar to that period, um, as Adam noted, uh, when a lot of Uli Hansen uh, buildings were being demolished um, in the 80s. Uh, the standards are a series of concepts about maintaining, repairing, and replacing historic materials, as well as designing new additions or making alterations. The standards also encompass related landscape features um, and the building's site environment, as well as attached, adjacent, or related new construction. The standards provide brief statements for four specific types of treatments, and the statements are intentionally vague and open to interpretation as they pertain to historic properties of all materials, sizes, and occupancy or construction types, and encompass both exteriors and the interiors of historic buildings. Since they are written broadly, they are accompanied by guidelines, which are so shown here on the screen, and various bulletins in interpret on interpreting the standards. Uh, and it is important to note that the standards and guidelines are, are not intended to be prescriptive, but rather um, uh, to manage change in the case of rehabilitation standards. Uh, so the next question is how are the standards used? Um, they're used at all levels of government. The federal agencies use standards and guidelines in carrying out their historic preservation responsibilities, such as reviewing tax credit applications or section 106 projects by the National Park Service. Um, state and local officials use them in analyzing project impacts under CEQA, and most per pertinent to our discussion is their application by landmark, historic district, and planning commissioners um, across the, the country who use the standards and guidelines to guide their design and review processes. Uh, another example of how they're used is for Mills Act properties, um, which must comply with the standards uh, for any work that is done. So in order, in order to utilize the standards, the appropriate treatment for a given project must be identified. The standards are organized into four different types of treatments, including preservation, restoration, reconstruction, and rehabilitation, which I'll give a brief intro about each of them. So preservation focuses on the maintenance and repair of, the, of existing historic materials and the retention of a property's form as it has evolved over time. A good example of preservation is the National Register listed Goldschmidt House right here in San Clemente. The house was constructed in 1928 um, and identified character finding features have been preserved and maintained over time to reflect a specific time period. Restoration uh, depicts a property at, the, at a particular period of time in its history while removing evidence of other periods. Uh, for example, uh, Montpellier, the home of James and Dolly Madison, it has um, had acquired by the national was acquired by the National Trust for Historic Preservation in the 80s, and it was very much altered and enlarged since it was first constructed. That's, re that's shown in the top photo. Based on historical documentation and research, Montpellier was accurately restored to its 1820s appearance, appearance when the president and his wife lived there. This is an, is an example of a larger restoration project, but they can also be smaller projects, uh, such as removing non-original vinyl windows and restoring wood windows to how they would have appeared at a certain period. And then that brings us to reconstruction. 
uh, reconstruction recreates vanished or non-surviving portions of a property for interpretive purposes. An example of reconstruction is the Boyle Hotel, which is depicted here. Um, and this is in Boyle Heights, the neighborhood of Los Angeles. Uh, since it was initially constructed in 1889, the condition of the building had deteriorated over the years and some of the decorative elements had been removed. Uh, specifically, those included the parapet and the upper portion of the, the corner turret, which is depicted in the photo on the left. Uh, and they were reconstructed in 2012, which is depicted in the photo on the right. Uh, so this is a good example of that treatment, as well as the next treatment, rehabilitation, as this building was reopened it, with 51 units of affordable housing, as well as three ground floor commercial spaces, although it was originally a hotel. Uh, so the next is rehabilitation. Uh, and this is the most pertinent and um, often will be the, the standard that you will use um, in reviewing projects. So rehabilitation acknowledges the need to alter or add to a historic property to meet continuing or changing uses while retaining the property's historic character. An excellent example of re rehabilitation in San Clemente is the Casa Romantica. In fact, it has been adaptively, adaptively reused multiple times. Initially from a single family residence to a senior board and care facility, a wedding and event center and a cultural center and education facility. So this is a good example that I'm sure you are all very familiar with. Uh, the next portion of uh, the presentation and what I will keep brief is a discussion of integrity. Um, the choice of treatment depends on a variety of factors, including the property's historical significance, physical condition, proposed use, and intended interpretation. Across the various applications of each treatment, the bottom line is to ensure that the resource retains its integrity. Uh, so integrity is a technical preservation term relating to the ability of a property to convey its significance. It is not related to structural integrity, and it should not be conflated with condition. There are seven specific acts, um, aspects of integrity, uh, which are depicted on the screen, some of which may be more vital than others. Thus, it must be determined based on the significance and essential physical features, which aspect of integrity are particularly vital to the historic property. For example, a property that is significant for architecture should most likely retain its integrity of design, materials, workmanship, and feeling, as opposed to a property that is significant for its association with a historic person, while other aspects like design and materials might be more altered and thus the integrity is not retained, it should at least retain integrity of location, feeling, and association from when that person occupied that property. And we could honestly go into a whole other hour long presentation to discuss the concept of integrity alone. So we'll end it there today. Um, but related to integrity is the character defining features, which are necessary to identify in order to analyze integrity. So the character defining features are the essential physical features that must be present for a property to represent or convey its significance. There are architectural components that contribute to a building's sense of time and place. And uh, well said in one of the National Park Service's preservation briefs, Preservation Brief 17, states that even though buildings may be of historic rather than architectural significance, it is their tangible elements that embody its significance for association with specific events or persons. And it is those tangible elements, both on the exterior and interior, that should be preserved. Uh, you may think that um, character defining features are often quite obvious, such as fat, fancy moldings, original flooring, grand staircases, but the Secretary of Interior's stand, um, guidance on character defining features includes many things that may not be so obvious, such, such as circulation patterns, plaster walls, or the volume of an important space. Uh, but character defining features can generally be grouped into three categories. They include the overall visual character, exterior materials and craftsmanship, and interior spaces, features, and finishes, um, which of course only apply to certain um, uh, designations uh, and uh, areas that actually specify that interiors are preserved. Um, but I'll walk you through some examples just to gain an understanding of what uh, character defining features um, may be. Uh, so the first category is overall visual character of a building, and these include 
uh, things such as the setting, height, scale, massing, roof lines, fenestration patterns, or design features. Um, so for example, the distinctively shaped roofs and um, corner towers and turrets of the Ole Hansen Beach Club are important in defining its historic character. Um, the materials as well, of course, but we'll go into that next, but um, you know, one of its significance is as a Spanish colonial revival building. So those would apply for the Ole Hansen Beach Club. And then moving into the exterior materials and craftsmanship, they may include the hand uh, traveled stucco, red clay barrel tiles, wood timbers, um, specific windows, and other decorative details. And then next is interior spaces, features, and finishes, which could include circulation patterns, lobbies, moldings, built in cabinetry, flooring, or wainscoting. Um, and generally, the interior public and semi-public spaces will receive more scrutin scrutiny than private spaces, um, such as uh, here's the Miramar Theater. Um, if we were looking at the interior, uh, the character defining features space ca character defining features would include the lobby space, um, the size of the auditorium. So it's more about the volume and then the circulation you know, from one entry space into the, the, the larger auditorium hall. And then of course, there are also the features and finishes such as the original light fixtures or the wood corpels with decorative carving. So the character boundary features also have relative importance, which depends on the quality, visibility and integrity of each feature. Uh, we typically categorize character defining features as either primary, secondary, or um, we also will identify specific features that are just not character defining. Uh, some firms even have a third category, which is called tertiary. Um, but that, uh, but that really comes down to uh, the primary identifying the primary character defining features as those that um, are the ones that are most important in conveying the building's significance. Um, so here's a, a picture of a table that will often com uh, complete for buildings and identifying their character finding features. Um, so what have we covered so far? Uh, the Secretary of Interior Standards are organized into four treatments. They include preservation, rehabilitation, restoration, and reconstruction. The appropriate treatment depends on the historic um, historical significance of a property, its physical condition, proposed use, and intended interpretation. Character defining features are the tangible architectural components that contribute to a building's sense of time and place and contribute to a building's significance while integrity is the ability of the property to actually convey that significance. Uh, so the next part of the presentation will go into more detail specifically about um, the standards for rehabilitation. Um, but first, I just wanna take a pause and see if anyone has any questions before we move on. I don't hear anybody jumping in, but I do want to say that uh, um, we were presented the photos of the Miramar Hope um, Theater two slides earlier. And Sunday, the Historic Society uh, had a presentation uh, Sunday afternoon, and it played to a packed house um, telling the status of the renovation. So mm -hmm. that uh, shows the interest our city has in the uh, historic preservation. Um, well, that's great to hear. And I'm honestly not surprised, but glad to hear it as well. Um, so since we don't have any questions thus far, we can continue with the presentation, uh, which moves into a specific discussion about the rehabilitation standards, um, which are probably the most commonly utilized standard of the four. And there are essentially 10 brief statements written by the National Park Service. As I explained earlier, the statements are intentionally somewhat vague and open to interpretation. And this allows them to be adaptable to a variety of property types um, because no two historic properties are alike. Uh, the goal of this, the rehab standards is to extend the useful life of the property and to ensure that it retains integrity after the project is completed. The general guiding principles are to preserve historic features and materials to the greatest extent feasible, repair rather than replace, and any necessary alterations and materials um, 
sorry, I apologize. Any necessary alterations should be compatible but distinguishable and alterations should always be reversible to the greatest extent feasible. Um, so we'll take a look at each of the rehabilitation standards in more detail. And I want to just emphasize again as we go through these that the rehab standards are not intended um, are specifically intended to manage change and not prevent change. So rehabilitation standard one is um, a property will be used as it was historically or be given a new use that requires minimal change to its distinctive materials, features, spaces, spaces and spatial relationships. Um, so we can go back to the example of Casa Romantica. As part of the adaptive reuse, modifications to the property were necessary to accommodate the new use. Character defining feature of, of the properties, um, a, character defining features of the property include the residents and mature trees planted during the period of significance. These were retained while non-character defining features such as the remaining grounds and structures, which were altered or demolished. The grounds were developed into horticultural gardens with new terraces to create additional usable space for the community. Uh, some of these alterations um, were essentially necessary um, for completing uh, for completing its new use. Um, and they anything that was restored or uh, retained was based on physical or documentary evidence, which defined the character defining features. Another example of a recent adaptive reuse project that we worked on is the former Bank of Italy, um, now the Nomad Hotel in downtown Los Angeles. The change of use from, was from office to hotel. And although the scale is much different than what you would see in San Clemente, um, I included this because it's a good example of um, the existing conditions of the building uh, being well suited for its proposed new use. Uh, for rehab standard one, the heart of the matter is that the historic building should, uh, should naturally lend itself to the new use. The program should be adapted to fit the building, not the other way around. If a project does not comply with standard one, it will probably not comply with some of the following standards that we'll discuss. Uh, rehabilitation standard two is the historic character of a property shall be retained and preserved. The removal of historic materials or alteration of features and spaces that characterize a, a property shall be avoided. Standard two basically boils down to preserve the character defining features. Two features widely recognized as important CDFs are often windows and the exterior cladding. Um, they are also commonly altered features, as I'm sure you've seen many times. Uh, so here are two very similar buildings from the same neighborhood. The first retains its original smooth stucco cladding and multi-light windows. The second has been altered with vinyl, vinyl and louvered metal windows and applied textured stucco. Um, and as I said, some of the most common alterations include replacing windows, uh, resizing windows, or adding more windows. Um, so as the, continuing with the example, the one on the right, um, would be an example of incompatible uh, with standard two uh, due to um, adding materials that would not have been there historically and removing any original windows. Uh, similarly here, um, we see more examples of window alterations, um, incompatible vinyl windows on the upper floor and inappropriate metal security bars on the ground floor. This also shows an example of bad materials replacement. And then another commonly altered feature in space are entrances and porches. Main, entrance, uh, main entrances and porches are primary CDFs on historic buildings in design materials as well as configuration. Common alterations include replacing doors, relocating doors, infilling porches, changing porch materials and then adding doors. Um, so shown here is an example of bad porch infill. Um, in most cases, porches should just not be infilled. However, there are more appropriate ways of achieving porch infill um, related to San Clemente, maybe if smaller buildings were constructed on properties and therefore um, people, owners might want to increase the square footage of their home. So there are appropriate ways of doing so. Um, it's mostly a, about 
best practices, following best practices, um, mostly their best practices uh, would advise partial infill of a porch, such that a portion of the original porch opening remains. Um, also, any architectural feature, features or interesting details should be retained and be legible. Uh, in this example, only half of the porch has been infilled and the original wood railing, porch supports, and ornamentation are retained. The key here is that the alteration can be reversible. Another example, not really sure what's going on in this house. You can clearly tell that it was altered. Perhaps the second floor balcony was infilled, um, but you can see what um, inappropriate um, enclosure of a porch or balcony might do. It completely changes the, the overall massing, um, which is the overall visual character in terms of character defining features. Uh, so it moves on to rehabilitation standard three, which states that each property shall be recognized as a physical record of its time, place, and use, changes that create a false sense of historical development, such as adding conjectural features or architectural elements from other buildings shall not be undertaken. Uh, one of the most commonly used examples of rehabilitation standard three is the Viking treatment shown here. The application of ornamentation that would not have been originally on this building gives it a false sense of history um, and misleading as to when it was originally constructed and how it changed over time. Rehabilitation standard four states that changes to a property that have acquired significance in their own right will be retained and preserved. An example is the non-original storefront of the Frolic Room at the Pantages Theater. The theater was constructed in the 1920s during prohibition. So no one going to the theater at the time was stopping at the bar beforehand. This business was established later in the 1930s after prohibition ended and established significance in its own right. So although part of the property and not originally um, part of the building, um, it has itself gained significance under a different um, criterion. Uh, Rehabilitation Standard 5 states that distinctive features, finishes, and construction techniques or examples of craftsmanship that characterize a property shall be preserved. So once again, character-defining features should be preserved. Character-defining features on the mirror mark would, in, uh, would include the hand child stucco cladding, the roof form with hipped roofs, towers, and overhanging eaves with exposed wood rafters, as well as the red clay tile roofing. Um, another interesting um, feature to note for the Miramara is the, um, the marquee itself, um, which would be considered an essential character defining feature as it is important to conveying its original use as a theater. So these features that characterize the property would need to be preserved in order to comply with standard five. Removal of these features would not comply with the standards. This is why the first step in applying the standards is identifying the character defining features um, and why it's so important. Other examples of work that would not comply with standard five would be the removal of plaster from a wall to expose brick in spaces that would have been finished historically um, or removing ceilings or brick that would not, um, um, let me back up there. So removal of plaster walls to expose brick in spaces that would have been finished historically or exposing ceilings or brick that was not exposed historically. Um, these items would not be in keeping with the historic character of the property. Uh, rehabilitation standard six states that deteriorated historic features shall be repaired rather than replaced. Where the severity of deterioration requires replacement of a distinctive feature, the new feature shall match the old in design, color, texture, and other visual qualities. And where possible, materials and where possible materials, replacement of missing features shall be substantiated by documentary physical or pictorial evidence. So here's an example of original narrow wood slat hardwood flooring uh, where the deterioration would necessitate replacement. Um, the picture on the right shows hardwood flooring in a chevron pattern. Um, although it might be historic, replacing the photo, the wood hardwood flooring on the left with um, the photo on the right um, would not be a true in-kind replacement. Another example, the photo on the left shows rotted wood shingles that have been replaced in kind with matching wood shingles. Um, of course, they look a little different in color because they haven't aged as the other ones so clearly have, um, but it is still compatible in terms of materials and you unfortunately just cannot 
um, achieve the patina of age um, in some cases, but as an example of appropriate uh, replacement. Um, another example on the right, uh, after the damaged portion. Me, can, I, can I ask you a question real quick? Of course. So would it be appropriate to paint all of the new uh, shake or shingles, you know, to tie everything in? I assume it would be. Um, so the that's a, that's a very good question. So as part of standard six, actually, um, any material such as wood that was not historically painted shouldn't be painted. Now, because the shingles on this house um, were not painted, it actually looks like paint might have been removed to restore the original appearance. Um, but if they weren't originally painted, they should not be painted. Um, now, a treatment could be done to the new wood to achieve the look of age. That would be perfectly fine to blend in. Um, uh, but yeah, I have a feeling that that's why the paint appears to have been removed, and that is why you know it has a an appearance um, as it does. So this this would be an acceptable look. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Huh. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Um, so uh, back to the photo on the uh, right. Uh, after the damaged portions of the base of this baluster were repaired, the cast iron columns were cleaned and, in this case, repainted um, to protect the metal from rusting as the column was originally painted. Rehabilitation Standard 7 states that chemical or physical treatments such as sandblasting that cause damage to historic materials shall not be used. The surface uh, cleaning of structures, if appropriate, shall be undertaken using, using the gentlest means possible. So for example, um, sandblasting is a, a big no-no for on brick as it takes off the protective layer. So that's shown on the left. Um, and then it, it is also not recommended to remove sound stucco or to repair damaged stucco with new stucco that is different in composition um, from the historic material. Uh, patching stucco or concrete without removing the source of deterioration or replacing deteriorated stucco with the synthetic stucco, um, an exterior insulation and finishing systems or other non-traditional materials. Um, so back to uh, in-kind replacement again. Uh, another common and appropriate treatment is painting materials that were not originally painted. We often find that original wood trim has been inappropriate painted over in historic homes. Um, paint should be carefully removed using the gentlest means possible, such as the original wood uh, remains undamaged and the historically natural finish um, will be restored. There's also appropriate uh, means for removing paint, uh, hand scraping, um, of uh, peeling paint from wood siding uh, in preparation for repainting is an important part of regularly scheduled maintenance um, and the most appropriate means of removing paint rather than just using a chemical paint thinner. Uh, oftentimes we also see that owners of historic properties, especially in the Mills Act, um, will, will repaint historic windows and over time these without removing the paint and over time the built up layers of paint, um, whether on windows or molding and trim um, will of, often muddle the original molding design or any decorative wood carvings. And uh, that leads us to standard eight, which uh, states that significant archeological resources affected by a project shall be protected and preserved. If such resources must be disturbed, mitigation measures shall be undertaken. So standard eight typically applies to um, previously undeveloped sites. And we often, often will conclude that if a site is potentially an archaeological site through record search results, um, uh, and we'll consult an architectural, um, an archaeologist if necessary. So it is unlikely um, that this board would determine effects on archaeological sites, um, but we do um, often identify in areas um, such as shown here, a large parking lot. Um, what we'll note. Um, in like a Secretary of Interior Standards Compliance Memo is that um, while excavation is done of, on the undeveloped portions, um, if anything is found during construction work, that work pauses and uh, consultation with the city is undergone to make sure that there's nothing um, of archaeological note. 
Uh, can I ask another question about that last image? Of course. What 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 would you expect to find of archaeological nature on a property like this? Um, well, I think that's one of the underlying points that you know on sites and in areas that are well developed, it's not necessarily likely likely that you'll find anything. Um, but if something does come up, you know, it's just good practice to, to make the construction team aware that there's a possibility and if it is found. Um, so what's an example? I mean, what, just give us an example of what you might see that would lead you to believe there was some, it was an archeological, I mean, this is not, uh, it's not Europe. I don't know what image this is, but. Um, well, I think that, uh, so record search results will often um, return um, conclusive evidence of um, sensitive sites. Um, it can be Native American heritage sites. Uh, it can, it, in this area, most, most often is uh, related to Native American history. Um, I think another example that I can uh, write off the top of my head is we did an SOIS compliance memo for, um, I don't remember the exact property address, but at 1500 block um, uh, in San Clemente, it was, it is the um, art studio. Um, they're proposing building a new wall to convert the building to uh, for event space. Um, so I know that in the, the building history of that property, it was noted that um, the building was originally a ceramic studio and in building additions, uh, there were shards of ceramic pieces found when they were building additions. So, I mean, that might be something um, that's related to archeological sites that wouldn't be architecture per se. Does that kind of help? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, and yeah, I mean, artifacts in the ground could even be related to fragments of Ole Hansen. It could be his glasses. I mean, <laughs> so the, the point being that this probably will not come up often. Um, and uh, an archaeologist is really necessary. That's really outside of my area of expertise. Um, so that brings us to standard nine and 10, probably the two most interesting. Um, as far as new development goes. So standard nine and 10 both have to do with new additions, exterior alterations and related new construction. Standard nine states that new additions, exterior alterations or related new construction shall not destroy historic materials that characterize the property. The new work shall be differentiated from the old and shall be compatible with the massing, size, scale and architectural features to protect the historic integrity of the property and its environment. Standard 10 states that new additions an adjacent or related new construction shall be undertaken in such a manner that if removed in the future, the essential form and integrity of the historic property and its environment would be unimpaired. So in general, additions should be designed to be, simply, to be simple and secondary to the original building. They should be located on rear elevations and small additions to side elevations may also be okay, but they must, must be compatible in scale, massing, design and materials, yet also differentiated. They should be clear to a professional where the original building ends and the addition begins. This can be accomplished by designing the roof height to be below the primary roof structure, using recesses and wall planes, adding battens, or changing to a different but compatible material, such as from wood shingle to wood clapboard. Other appropriate ways to differentiate new additions could be the use of simplified window designs. If the historic windows on the original building are two over two, then one over one could be used on the addition. And additions must be constructed so that they can be easily removed or reversible in the future. Um, so let's walk through some quick examples. Um, I put this photo on here as well. Um, obviously this is um, the, the casino and the rear has some one story additions that were constructed um, over time. They're all compatible. They um, are smaller, and so they're compatible in size, scale, and massing. Um, they, they take a back seat to the original building and, and are also compatible with size, or I'm sorry, style. 
<clears throat> so then walking through some other examples, uh, the first edition is appropriate placed to the rear of the property. It is clad in a textured stucco consistent with the primary house, but it's differentiated by its simple flat parapet. The doors are also compatible wood, but differentiated with um, single lights. Another example shows a compatible addition differentiated from the main house by its fixed single light windows and a vertical strip of trim as shown. And the shed um, roof of the addition is also constructed beneath the roof line of the original portion, portion of the house. So you can uh, visibly see that differentiation. And moving on to the next example, big no-nos are typically highly visible rooftop additions as shown here. Although the addition is in the correct location at the rear of the building, it is way overscaled and thus still visible from the public right of way, which alters the historic character of the building's massing. The addition is constructed in, um, in a modern style, incompatible with original craftsman style residents. While the style does not necessarily have to be of the same style because it is um, so overscaled and visible, it would not be would not comply with the standards. Um, so here's another example where the addition is in the right location to the rear, yet again it is not to scale nor compatible in style. Oh, I apologize. This I switched the slides out and now we are, that is not correct. Um, one moment. Okay, yes. So here's an example of an addition that is in a highly visible front elevation. The materials are okay, the scale is okay, and would probably comply with the standards uh, were or not for its location. Um, however, it should be noted that some cities this addition would be considered okay, while others um, it would not. Um, it really depends on the the culture of the city and whether they prefer um, what the balance is between the differentiation and compatibility um, in order to maintain the historic character uh, and the identity of the building. Um, oh, another point to note before we move on from um, that standard um, is that. As I said earlier, the standards are not prescriptive and there is no formula for prescribing, uh, no formula or prescription for designing a compatible new addition or related new construction on site. Nor is there generally only one possible design approach that will meet the standards. But because they have been in use for quite some time now, most places have developed do's and don'ts, uh, which vary depending upon the culture of the city. Um, the important thing is to be consistent with the approach that is taken across different projects. And so oh, for a review of this portion, um, this lengthy information that we've covered so far, uh, the general best practices are to preserve character defining features to the extent possible, repair character, defi character defining features rather than replace. Uh, when, when character defining features are beyond repair, they may be replaced in kind. Necessary alterations should be compatible with historic, the historic character of the property, but distinguishable as non-original, AKA no conjectural features and um, necessary alterations should be reversible. Um, so I've included some links to sources of additional information. There is a ton of good stuff available for free, including the National Park Service's preservation briefs, one of which I quoted earlier, and the National Park Service's um, in, uh, interpreting the standards bulletins. Um, so thank you for listening to this portion of the presentation. I just want to ask if there's more uh, questions before we get into the um, next portion about uh, certified local governments. Uh, I think we need to move along. We've got seven minutes to go, so uh, let's keep on moving. Okay, great. Sorry, but I didn't realize the time was um, moving so quickly. Um, so as far as um, the certified local government program goes, um, the program was um, established uh, in the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. Um, 
which um, and, and it, in its 1980 amendment and provided for the establishment of a CLG program to encourage the direct participation of local governments in identification, evaluation, registration, and preservation of historic properties within their jurisdiction, um, and to promote um, the integration of local preservation interests and concerns into local planning and deci the decision making process. Um, so, as you're aware, the city of San Clemente is a certified local government. Um, and it's really about um, uh, preservation through partnership. And so I'm going, because of the time, I'm going to kind of skip ahead to um, focusing on the responsibilities and requirements. Um, let me see here. Um, so as part of this CLG program, um, it basically requires that um, cities uh, maintain and um, create le 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 carry out legislation uh, for the designation and protection of historic properties, um, establish and maintain a qualified historic preservation commission, um, and through that, identify historic properties, as well as provide for public participation participation in local historic preservation programs. Um, one great opportunity uh, of being a CLG is funding. Um, you're avail it is possible to apply for uh, grants um, as the city has done many times in the past for projects such as the Historic Resources Survey Update, um, as well as the North Beach Historic District nomination, um, National Register nomination. Um, it's also um, one other perk is also to receive technical assistance, as Adam noted. Um, it, the city has done many trainings and also has hosted training sessions. Um, regular training is also offered by the state office historic um, historic preservation um, and NPS. Um, and then, of course, the uh, CLG list serve um, the in California. Uh, the Cal LGL is maintained by the California State Office of Historic Preservation, um, and in one is one of the ways that um, the program uh, disseminated uh, information and provides technical assistance to CLGs, and it serves as an open forum for the posting of questions um, by members, which uh, include um, historical review commissions or boards, uh, as well as other local government employees. Uh, anybody essentially that has an interest in um, local preservation and planning. Um, other perks um, are also that it comes with sustainability, uh, being credibility, streamlining, uh, basically that comes down to your adoption of the Secretary of Interior Standards and applying those concepts uh, as part of your review. Um, it makes sure that everything that you are approving is streamlined and in line with what the National Parks Service and Secretary of Interiors uh, would approve, um, as well as indirect economic benefits, which are really just show, shown by the success um, of San Clemente as a destination, um, as a place with a beautiful historic um, downtown um, and essentially revitalizing. Uh, and as you move forward, now it all relates back to historic preservation and applying the Secretary of Interior standards. Um, so I'm sorry if I breeze to that last portion. I don't. I want to be sensitive of your time. I know I already um, took up more than I should. Uh, but if I, if you do have any uh, questions, I'm happy to answer, um, or I'd be happy to answer any after, since we're short on time. If um, the city wanted to put together a list. Okay. Would uh, anybody on the um... Commission like to ask a question? I would like to thank um, Audrey for her time and effort. And uh, Adam, do you want to uh, know hey, any idea? Okay, um, Commissioner McCann. Do we have time for a couple questions? Uh, I'm going to allow time because it's an important, oh, an important subject. Okay, Tr trying to be super brief. First of all, your presentation was awesome, Audrey, super great, and I really appreciate it. Um, in a very brief way, um, I guess the question first for Chair Crandall is most of what we see in the historical realm is for single family homes. Is that accurate? Okay, That's so it's, it's single family homes is the historic aspect of it 
primarily or exclusively the exterior or are there interior aspects as well? Audrey, would you like to handle that? I can say what historically we've done. Um, yeah, sure. So um, the designation of the property would have to specify whether the interior exterior is included. Um, and as far as San Clemente is concerned, uh, and Adam, correct me if I'm wrong, but the interiors are not included as part of local designation. And that would be in the, the city's historic preservation ordinance. Uh, that is correct, and although, so you know, on projects like the Miramar and major commercial projects, absolutely, we are concerned about the uh, interiors. Sure, but for single families, exterior only. Correct. Okay. Um, how does Title 24 compete with historic, you know, relative to energy efficiency of windows and doors? I'm guessing the historic wins out over that? Um, yes, so anything, any property that uh, has a designation uh, as a historic resource or historical um, resource, uh, depending on if you're referring to CEQA, um, they have, they adhere to the historic building code. Um, okay. But that is a good question. And actually the Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation has a specific, um, uh, specific standards for sustainability. So it does address, um, you know, how to weatherproof uh, windows, whether it's soundproof, weatherproofing, um, how best to apply um, uh, solar panels, for example. Uh, so it is taken into consideration, yes. And that's a good resource to, to peruse as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so regarding, you know, we have an applicant, they're proposing changes to historic structure um, the judge is then the design review subcommittee. Is that is that they're the judging body? Is that accurate? We um, in in town we are the reviewing body, but in most cases, uh, those projects do go to commission level also. So the okay. final cultural heritage permit would be um, grouped together with any CUPs, any changes, etc. Okay, awesome. And then last question. There, you had a picture of like a brick addition. It would have been fine if it was in the back, but it was in the front. I'm just wondering about properties where there is essentially no rear yard, but there is front yard space. Are they allowed to do additions in the front or, or they're kind of out of luck? Uh, no, another great question. Um, it is certainly an option when it comes to... Um, so if we were looking at that property and analyzing whether it was appropriate or not in compliance with the standards, um, if there were no other feasible option to accommodate uh, an addition in the rear or on the side, uh, and the front was the only um, feasible option because there is no addition or rear or side, um, it would be considered uh, a potential option, uh, but then it would really, um, there would be more importance given to size compatibility in terms of massing. Um, basically, in that case, I would recommend that the architect uh, developers work closely with an architectural historian to make sure that the design um, is as, mo as compatible um, as it possibly can be in compliance with the standards. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Presentation. Um, Audrey, we will recess the uh, study session, and does anyone need a short break before we um, start the uh, Planning Commission meeting? Okay, we will jump right in, and uh, Adam, can we uh, we'll go ahead and just start at this point? Yeah, we're still rolling. So as Very soon as, uh, as soon as the commission is ready to go, uh, we can be out. Okay, uh, I will call to order the regular meeting of the Planning Commission for the City of San Clemente, Wednesday, September 22nd, 2021. Um, and Adam, could you uh, call roll for us? I believe we have the Pledge of Allegiance is our second item. 
Uh, no, excuse me, you're absolutely correct. Is there anyone who has not uh, led the pledge who would like to lead it this evening? Um, Commissioner Prescott, we'd love to have you do it. Great. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I'm looking at my neighbor's flag, barely. And thank you, uh, Adam, for correcting me on that. Um, now we can go to roll call. Commissioner Camp? Here. Commissioner Cosgrove? I do not see him, um, so he is absent. Commissioner McCaukin? Here. Commissioner Prescott Leffler? Here. Chair Pro Tem McCann? Here. Vice Chair Tyler? And I do not see her either. And Chair Crandall? Here. The next item of business is special orders of business and special presentations. We have none today. Uh, the next item is uh, the minutes, and we have two sets of minutes to uh, review and approve. The first is the study session meeting of September 8th, 2021. Do we have a motion or revisions? Move to approve. Have a motion. Second. So we have a motion by Commissioner McConkin and a second by Commissioner Prescott. Um, we will take a, a roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner uh, Prescott? Yes. Commissioner McCann? Aye. Commissioner Camp? Aye. Uh, Commissioner McCaukin? Aye. And Commissioner Crandall is an aye, so it passes uh, 5 um, zero 2. The next um, set of minutes is the regular planning commission meeting of September 8th, 2021. Do we have a motion or revisions? Motion to approve. Uh, we have a motion by Commissioner Prescott. Do we have second. a second? Uh, we have a second by Commissioner uh, McCaukin. Uh, okay. We'll do a roll, roll call vote. And we have uh, Commissioner McCann. Aye. Commissioner Prescott. Uh, you're muted. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Prescott, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Camp. Aye. Commissioner Cochin. Aye. And Commissioner Crandall uh, is an aye, passes 502. Um, our next item is oral and written communications. Um, Adam, do we have any uh, written communications uh, on any subject not on the agenda tonight? Chair Crandall, we do not have any uh, written communications from uh, the public um, that are not related to an agenda item. Very good. Uh, the next item is the consent calendar, which we have no items. So we are now to the public hearing portion. Um, we have one item this evening, um, item A, 429 North El Camino Real, conditional use permit 21069, Sunny's Pizza and Pasta, full alcohol, and Katie Crockett is our staff member presenting. Katie. Thank you, Chair Crandall. Good evening, commissioners. Let me just um, share my screen. I have a really short presentation just so you don't have to listen, only listen to me talk. Um, so there it is. Uh, can you all see that, Commissioner Crandall? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, all right, so um, the item before you this evening, CUP 21069, is a request made by Sunny's um, to serve full, a full line of alcoholic beverages at their restaurant located at 429 North El Camino Real in the downtown T-Zone. Sunny's has been in operation since 1980 and their existing restaurant includes indoor and outdoor seating. They currently have approval to serve beer and wine and are requesting to expand that service to include a full alcohol service. So this would be an ABC type 47 license, which includes on sale spirits, as well as beer and wine um, at, at a restaurant, uh, and also includes ancillary limited off sale alcoholic beverages with their takeout services. 
The restaurant is located near the intersection of North El Camino Real and Avenida Palizada in a mixed use area within the downtown T-zone and within the central business overlay where pedestrian oriented uses are prioritized. The proposed hours are consistent with their existing approvals to serve beer and wine. Police services did review the application and had no issues with the move from just beer and wine to full alcohol service at this location. Additionally, uh, these hours, as you can see here, are uh, consistent with other nearby establishments, most of which are approved to serve until midnight. Standard conditions for uses, which include alcohol services, have been included in the draft resolution, such as establishing permitted hours for alcohol service and requiring alcohol beverage uh, service training for all employees. The proposed alcohol service is consistent with goals and policies in the general plan land use element, particularly related to the central business overlay and the downtown core area, as well as general plan economic development goals and policies. With that, staff does recommend that the commission approve the conditional use permit to allow Sunnies to serve a full range of alcoholic beverages by adopting resolution PC 21-017. This concludes my report and I am happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, thank you, uh, Katie. Did you have any um, letters or comments from the public on this item? No public, no public comments this evening. Um, the applicant and uh, owner, Julie Regenovich, is uh, in attendance this evening as well. Very good. Okay, um, commissioners, does anyone have a question for Katie or actually the applicant? I see none, so we will close the presentation portion, open it for public comment. It's been... Uh, um, stated by staff that there are no public comments at this point, so we'll open it up for discussion. Uh, do we have any discussion or a motion on the resolution? Chair sure, Crandall. Uh, Commissioner McCann. Yeah, I'd just like to say that um, I've been to the site and I'm familiar with it and their operation, and I concur with the staff and the findings um, and I'm in support of the project, of the, uh, you know, conditional use permit. Very good. Uh, any other comments at this time? Uh, Commissioner McCann, would you like to make a motion then on the resolution? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, I move that uh, we approve resolution number PC 21-017 of the Planning Commission of San Clemente, approving conditional use permit 21-069, Sunny's Pizza and Pasta, full alcohol, um, to allow full alcohol service for on-site consumption indoors and outdoors at an existing restaurant located at 429 North El Camino Real. We have a motion by McCann, do we have a second? Second. Yes, McCann. Uh, I'm not sure who uh, jumped in first. I think Karen did. Okay, um, you're a gentleman. Uh, Commissioner Prescott has a second. Uh, we will take the roll call vote. Um, Commissioner McCann? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Prescott? Aye. Commissioner Camp? Aye. Commissioner McCocken? McCocken, aye. And Commissioner Crandall is an aye. So it passes 502. Um, so we are on already to uh, new business. We have one item, outdoor dining and parklet zoning amendment. Uh, Jonathan Lightfoot is staff presenting this item. Um, let's see, Adam, do you have any um, preamble or anything you want to say for this item? You know, uh, I'll uh, provide a light introduction for Jonathan, but um, he will handle this um, uh, very well, as I'm sure he does. Uh, I'm sure he will, as he does with uh, all of his projects. But this is a new business item uh, for the Planning Commission's consideration. Uh, this is based on some council direction, and uh, their timing requires that um, we take something that generally would have been provided in a study session setting um, uh, 
uh, earlier, and um, it's due to the fact that our study sessions are booked until uh, for the next uh, couple of months. So in order uh, to expedite um, the, this project, uh, we're bringing it to you as a new business item. Um, and uh, Jonathan will go over the process uh, that this uh, project will take uh, because it will be coming back to the Planning Commission uh, again at some time in the future. So with that, uh, Mr. Lightfoot, floor is yours. Great, thank you. Good evening, commissioners and Chair Crandall. Um, I do have a presentation that I'm gonna go through uh, that will touch on the different pieces kind of of how we arrived at the uh, place we are now. And I wanted to um, give a preemptive introduction. I invited four uh, community members to be available for questions. Uh, so they don't have uh, presentations to offer, but once we get through the presentation portion, I think that that could be a valuable um, component this evening is for you to be able to interact with uh, some of those community members who uh, have businesses um, that are impacted by this program and have an interest in that. So uh, we'll get to that uh, at, um, after the presentation, but at this point, I'm gonna transition, bear with me over to um, that presentation. Okay, so um, this evening we're looking at uh, the policy for outdoor dining in parklets. We do have an existing code section that discusses outdoor dining, um, but as uh, Adam mentioned, uh, our city council has initiated a zoning amendment to consider um, some permanent alterations for expansion of that program. Our current standards are discussed within our uh, zoning section 17.28.205 that was included as attachment two in the report um, so you'd have a printed copy of that if you'd like to reference that and, and a couple of quick standards that are uh, addressed within that are here so outdoor areas for instance are not permitted to encroach into required parking areas um, and that's going to be one of the key differences between our temporary program that we're currently running and the, the general standard within our code um, also, outdoor areas are limited to restaurant uses only. Um, there's seat limitations um, that come into play within that code section. And uh, finally, tables and chairs on public property um, have to be removed nightly. So as you can see that these bullets don't address the entire code section there, but there's a few items here uh, that you'll, you'll recognize are not consistent with the temporary COVID program that we have in place that's been more flexible. So the sec success of that temporary program um, can be attributed to a few things. Um, there's a pretty simplified application that's also provided within your packet as attachment one. Um, we looked to review uh, the applications as quickly as possible, typically under 30 days. Um, and we, we had agency support. So uh, I worked uh, with the Coastal Commission as did other agencies to get essentially a blanket sign off on the program in advance. So we didn't have to go to them individually uh, Prior to COVID, every single application that requested displacement of parking would have required a CDP, which is a process that would take months uh, in its own. Uh, the California Department of Alcoholic Beverage Control also had a very simple process. It was a single page application to allow for businesses to extend their service of alcohol beyond their front doors. Uh, and so we, uh, as I, I mentioned, in contrast to our existing pro, uh, code, we also allowed for the use of parking areas, both public and private. Um, later on in the program, council directed that we begin to assess fees and those are going to be used uh, in extending the trolley service. So that's coming up soon where we'll have extended weekend service. Um, and then finally, we had minimal design criteria um, to allow for a low barrier to entry. Uh, so, Low barriers to entry, but that will be something that we can discuss uh, this evening and, and ongoing to uh, consider how that could potentially be improved. So for council direction, um, there are a couple of things at play. So one, I just wanted to uh, make the commission aware um, that there is a CIP, a capital improvement project that's already been approved by the council uh, to widen the sidewalks uh, along Avenue to Victoria and the Pier Bowl. So that's one element that is already uh, moving forward. Uh, and then separately, there was an initiation for a zoning amendment for permanent expansion of outdoor dining. Um, generally, the public and, and the council have uh, been very supportive of 
uh, the change in public life that um, the outdoor dining has provided. And, and while COVID has ebbed and flowed, uh, the outdoor spaces have continued to be very popular with the community. Um, the council has um, requested more uniform design standards. Um, so that's one thing that would be in front of you as we move forward in this process. Um, and, and to look at building in safety uh, design considerations as well that can be standardized. So our goal is to look uh, towards having an ordinance uh, for that zoning amendment in place by March of 2022 um, that would allow us to implement a program in time for um, the higher season uh, of next year. Um, before I get into this example parklet program, I'm gonna rewind to um, real quickly onto our current stage. So what I'm looking for this evening is, uh, I would say 10, the 10,000 foot view comments and recommendations of the commission. Um, and I'll be coming back to you um, after collaborating with Adam's team in planning on redlining essentially our existing zoning code and, and bringing in some of the recommendations that you may have. So we don't have that in front of you tonight. Tonight is really just a, an opportunity to think through this program um, and reflect on your personal experiences, comments you may have had from the community and give us recommendations of what types of elements you think should be incorporated into um, that program. And then we'll be returning to you with uh, more of a, a text uh, version for you to, to comment on at that point. So at this point, I, I wanna uh, give a quick example. I'm gonna pivot away uh, from my PowerPoint. Give me one moment and I'm gonna share an example. Um, let's go with, There we go. Okay, so one program that uh, was successful prior to COVID um, and has been referenced uh, in a variety of cities nationally is San Francisco's program. So they, they created a parklet program um, in 2015 uh, that was well thought out. And so I'm gonna rewind a little bit to the, the title page of this program so that you can just see where we're starting from as a baseline. Um, this is San Francisco's, they call it grounds play. And the focus of the program is to recapture public streets um, and, and for a variety of purposes. So not just commercial. And they gave this uh, initial document and, and guideline uh, set is um, about 70 pages long. Uh, I'm gonna fast forward through this. We're not gonna touch on all of these different components, but I wanted to uh, go to their um, permitting criteria and process so that you could see uh, the, the level of detail that they went into. And, and I can tell that this screen is loading a little bit slow for me. So bear with me as I, I get to um, the permitting process function here and, and we'll review that and then move to their current um, shift that they're undertaking. Okay. So I, before I get to the permit, I do wanna to touch on this real quickly. So their parklet program goals are listed here. Um, and, and this can be a part, portion of our conversation as well this evening is, is to just hone in on what our specific goals are within San Clemente. So for them, it was to reimagine uh, the potential of city streets, as I mentioned, not just for commercial uses, but um, thinking broadly, what could these spaces be used for? to encourage non-motorized transportation. So they incorporated elements uh, where there was even required bicycle parking, et cetera, that could be tied to these parklets to encourage pedestrian activity, whether that's through additional seating, et cetera, um, fostering neighborhood interaction, and then finally supporting local businesses. And now I'm gonna get down through their department overview and focus on this uh, document here. So as this loads, um, you'll see that there's a, a, a complicated process that they looked at initially. Um, and so in preparing a parklet proposal, there's some initial public outreach, um, submitting that proposal, reviewing, selecting, and doing noticing. And you'll start to see here underneath timeframes that were incorporated, five weeks minimum, 
proposals would be selected and uh, at which point applicants would pay the fee and proceed to um, issuing public like formal public notices um, that could be lengthened if there were oppositions to that program. Um, you'd work through some advanced design moving forward. And, and again, you'll see that uh, in the green, some additional timeline considerations where it starts to reference six months maximum. Um, as you move forward, there's different agencies that review this uh, process for them. Planning would review the initial application. Their engineering department would uh, review, the, or review and issue the permits uh, for construction. Um, but it also had to get approval by their um, transportation and bike uh, group. So several different entities that were reviewing. Um, you'd move through the permitting process um, and do another stage of noticing regarding the installation, um, have a pre-inspection at the site and then construction um, and, and move through. And then you even at the very end could end up in a situation where there was objections and a potential revocation of the permit. So you, you can see that there's just a, a long process and San Francisco like us um, have an interest in trying to make that a little bit more streamlined. And so uh, they their board of supervisors recently approved adopting a, a version of their COVID program to replace uh, the, the version that we just looked at. So uh, this is, and I'll send uh, this link um, afterwards to this document. It's actually a draft version. So it was very recently uh, put together and the shared spaces manual, uh, as soon as we get into the segment here that talks about their timelines, you'll see that that has dramatically changed from what we were talking about before. So for sidewalks, parking lanes, and private lots, um, you're looking. They're looking for the, the um, staff review time frame um, to be limited to 30 days. And and public hearings are now an if necessary and only triggered in certain circumstances uh, element. So they they really are trying to speed up that process. Um, they do have fees that come into play. Um, and we don't need to get uh, into too much depth into that, but that probably would need to be a component of a program long term, um, given that a permanent program, again, will require coastal approval. And, and they're going to be looking for us to show that we're offsetting impacts to mobility and access to uh, the coastal areas uh, and, and fees that go towards uh, programs like the trolley are one way that we would be able to do that. Um, so that's I just I'm briefly highlighting that that is a component of their permanent program, but that they are looking to um, reduce the amount of time that that takes. Um, I'm not going to go into to Can more. Can I ask a question? Yeah, absolutely. I didn't see I was looking through this, but it's really small on my, my visual here. Was there like a pre-qualification for commercial insurance that would um, include the city? Correct. Yes. So that's something that we're already doing within our COVID program um, that they do have to provide insurance. And that's something that is a requirement in this jurisdiction as well in their program. And, then, and they would also name the city. Correct. Yes. So I'm going to end sharing this and wrap up on the PowerPoint presentation. Not too much more there. And then we will uh, transition into comments and questions. So that's the end of your presentation, Jonathan. Uh, a couple more page or a couple more slides here. Pardon me, yeah. and then we'll move on. So some challenges that that we have here in uh, San Clemente. Uh, there have been some complaints that staff have received regarding parking um, and the lack of availability of parking um, that has resulted from some parklets um, on especially our downtown Del Mar Street. Some complaints regarding platforms in front of neighboring businesses. Um, uh, there's a challenge with custom solutions being required in certain areas. Not all restaurants have uh, parking areas directly in front of them. Some of them only have loading areas. Some of them have ADA spaces or red curbs uh, that would limit their ability to have um, space. So that's going to be something that we have to account for. Um, and as I, I referenced earlier, um, the zoning amendment would get a recommendation from this body, this commission, 
uh, move forward to the council um, for approval, but then subsequently would need coastal approval. I referenced in your report a, a quick um, comment from staff at the Coastal Commission. They are looking at this from a, a state level perspective, which is a good sign uh, that hints to me that they are likely to uh, potentially even have some parameter criteria that we can work with. And that's, that's not been adopted yet, but I, I'm hopeful that there will be a um, you know, streamlined process with coastal once we get to that. Um, and then finally, th these are referenced within your report. So I'm not gonna read each one individually, but there are 11 different potential zoning ordinance changes. Um, and if there are, are a lot of comments, Commissioner Crandall, that are all over the place, potentially this could be a, a way to um, bring us back towards the end and, and maybe even think through uh, each of these points and, and whether uh, the commission is supportive of these different elements. Um, but with that, I, I do wanna transition to uh, comments and questions. I'm gonna give a quick introduction uh, here on this screen and I'll leave this up for a moment so that you can get familiar with who, are, who is joining us from the business community. Uh, we have uh, Steve Davis uh, from Goody's Tavern. He's representing the perspective of uh, a, a business that is using private property space for an outdoor dining area. He also is representing obviously a bar um, and in our current code only um, uh, bona fide restaurants are able to uh, participate in the outdoor dining. Uh, Mickey Rathman, um, and forgive me, the Neon Carrot Events is a, a side business, but she uh, has a brick and mortar on Del Mar, Mickey's on Del Mar. Uh, she's also very involved with our Downtown Business Association. She's representing the retailer's perspective. Um, and then I have two uh, representatives here for uh, restaurants that are using public parking areas on Del Mar. Uh, and that would be Ms. Donatella Polizzi from Pronto Italian Market and uh, Mr. Kyle Franson from Rancho Capistrano Winery. So those individuals are all available. I'm not asking them to provide presentations, but um, I think that they could be a resource as you have questions or thoughts uh, that they may be available to answer to those. Very good. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Um, Mal, got a question for you. Would you recommend we go through the normal pattern of... Um, uh, report, then public comment, then uh, discussion, or would you say just do this as an open forum and uh, um, since there's no decision that has to be made tonight, um, what's your recommendation on that? Yeah, there's there's no legal issue either way. Um, I would simply go with the way that staff wants you to approach it, but there's no there's no need legally to, to, to first take comment and then have discussion. It can be an open form if you feel like that's the most efficacious way forward. Yeah, I didn't want to put myself in a position where I had to limit uh, any speaker to three minutes or whatever. And there's no problem with an open forum. We can uh, accomplish that. Yep. Um, so let, let's start with questions um, to Adam. And uh, one general question uh, that I've got for him is whenever I take up a project or do something, I always want to have a program and know the scope of work. And I don't feel that we've gotten the direction from city council of the true scope of this or the program. Um, I mean, we're not San Francisco. I went and researched Park City and uh, they've got a very good step-by-step -step procedure that they went through before they started changing ordinances which is kind of what it looks like San Francisco. And Tampa Bay also um, is a good resource for that. And I think we need to do that because um, until we decide things like, I mean, um, this is now a question for you oh, since that's where we're at. Uh, the initial concept for the COVID was to provide restaurants with seating that they lost um, by having to have social distancing in their restaurant. So in effect, they kept about the same volume of business um, uh, that they always had to be effective. Is that correct? Uh, yes, Chair uh, Crandall. Um, the, the original intention was to replace indoor seating that was lost because of COVID. Okay. Then um, however, the, the scope of the current project uh, is, is different. And it's, exactly. Um, and uh, while I can describe it, uh, Mr. Lightfoot has been 
like has been spearheading this effort uh, the entire time. So I, I would prefer that you hear it uh, directly from him. Okay. Uh, his, 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 his knowledge of this uh, subject matter uh, uh, surpasses mine. Okay. I, I wanted to just then, uh, um, and then now the scope of work is uh, we're enlarging the restaurants. This is not just um, allowing them to replace lost seating. It's allowing them to increase in size. And in many cases, they're increasing in size, but decreasing parking. And there's got to be a way to quantify that somehow, I would assume, to really address this, um, this whole process. Have you given that um, much thought at this point, or are you looking for some kind of direction on that? No, I, I think that that's a very valid uh, concern. Um, council has provided some direction on the, I will say the purpose of this project. Uh, some, you know, some of it is related to an economic recovery uh, effort. Um, but there have been discussions about the uh, identification of outdoor dining and um, out the, the use of outdoor area for, uh, for uh, commercial purposes, uh, just being a general benefit. Uh, and, and not to say that it was discovered during COVID, but um, you know, I, I have heard from, from uh, multiple uh, people inside, you know, within the, the greater organization of the, of the city, but also members of the public talking about one of the benefits of, uh, of the worldwide pandemic being that uh, these spaces have really contributed to a destination, um, a, a more of a destination feel for the city of San Clemente. So well, that, that, that I'm not saying that's uh, any any of this is is accurate or not, but I'm agreeing that there's a lot more to consider here than there was initially uh, when 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 this the temporary program was was created. Um, I, I ju and just for the record, I do want to say that we do have some public comments, uh, and I can read those into uh, to the record at any time. But I I, I don't want uh, I want to make that that clear to everybody uh, whenever you're ready for them. Yeah, I, I think we'll bring those in when we invite um, um, the guests uh, to make their comments also and kind of lump that all together since theirs is also public comment. Um, Absolutely. Um, but to, to get back to your point, um, you, you know, at this point in time, we, staff is, is would like to elicit comments from the commission and as Jonathan mentioned in his presentation, the comments that that are, you know, comments in general are going to be beneficial. But the 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 types of comments that are most beneficial are uh, the ten thousand foot considerations that staff should incorporate into a draft ordinance. So that that could be specific. Um, uh, um, areas for um, improvement over the existing program, but it could also be concerns, uh, you know, as we transition from a temporary program into a more of a longer term program. So any of these, any of those comments are, are going to, to help inform staff's work moving forward. Okay, very good. Um, Commissioner McCacken, did you uh, want to ask a question? Yeah. Well, it's not a question, it's more of a comment. I would think, <clears throat> you know, a lot of the cities like San Francisco, Tampa, the places that you're mentioning, you know, they have parking structures that kind of take care of the unfairness of, you know, losing parking spaces. Um, but Mike, I'm in favor of like looking at it going forward, because I do think there is sort of a ambiance kind of thing with the good weather that we have, but I'm concerned about patient safety, what the standards will say about how the dining public is protected from the street. You know, the mass, the size, the height, the roof. Can you have a roof, shades, materials, what the costs and fees might be. And then what are you doing to mitigate the parking deficit that we're creating, which already exists there? You know, that's a big concern. Um, and then sort of the fairness issue of there's a lot of businesses who aren't restaurants 
but we've got to make sure that the restaurant isn't taking up the parking availability availability of the non-restaurant. So those are a number of my concerns, but I'm still in favor of looking at it because I, I do think that whole area of Del Mar is impacted big time in terms of parking. Um, there's not enough parking. There's several times I've wanted to go to the, a council meeting at the community center. And if you're not there about two hours before, if it's a important, you know, meeting with some kind of important agenda, you're not going to find parking. You're going to have to walk, you know, several blocks. So those are my concerns, but I do have a favorable impression to move forward to see what we might construct. Uh, thank you very much, um, Commissioner McCacken. Uh, Jonathan, would you like to introduce your your uh, guests and let each of them make a comment? And then I'm going to have Adam read in um, the uh, public comments that have come in uh, via the system. Sure. Okay, so uh, for those that are joining me from the business community, uh, feel free to take uh, a couple of minutes to give uh, your background, your name, what you do, and um, give uh, a quick uh, hit on your experiences with the existing program. Um, and, and then we'll certainly make uh, you all available for the commissioners to ask follow-up questions. A couple of those topics have already been raised, such as fairness, and we'll come back to those uh, along the way. Uh, but let's uh, start, if I can, with uh, Mickey Rathman. So Mickey is representing um, the retailers. Uh, and, and to be clear, if she's a, a representative, uh, she was not uh, appointed or nominated necessarily by the, by the community. I just want to make that clear. I, I grabbed a couple of people that could speak from uh, that sector. So Mickey's uh, going to be speaking from that perspective of a retailer on Del Mar. Uh, so go ahead. Excellent. Thank you so much um, for including us in this really important discussion. I own Mickey's on Del Mar, which is a retail store located at 220 Avenida Del Mar. And the pandemic was, of course, uh, crushing for all businesses downtown. And when restaurants were told to be closed and that they couldn't serve at all indoors, having the opportunity to have the outdoor dining deck was a blessing for them as well as for the retail stores, as it's one of those a rising tide lifts all boats so that as people were still able to come and eat and hang out downtown, they were also still able to come to the shops. Now that the restaurants are able to be open at 100% capacity inside, it is challenging. Um, the restaurant next door to me, Brussels Bistro, was unable to put the deck in front of their own business, so their deck is 100% in front of mine. Even today, someone came in and said, wow, I had to go up and down a number of times before I saw you because I didn't realize you were behind the restaurant because they have a large deck with a huge um, faux greenery wall as well as five market umbrellas and about six heaters. So it completely blocks visibility of my store from the street. So while I am supportive of the ambiance and the ability of restaurants to thrive and be successful, I do think that there needs to be, um, as everyone I think on the commission has already mentioned, the fairness of these sort of parklets or outdoor dining decks not blocking businesses that are not the restaurant. Well, thank you very much, Mickey. Um, Jonathan, you want to introduce the next one? Yes, thank you. Um, so I'll move on to uh, Mr. Kyle Franson. He is the owner of Rancho Capistrano Winery, also on Del Mar. Kyle, if you wouldn't mind giving your thoughts. Well, thank you, and, uh, and thanks for the invite. Um, uh, we still operate at less than 100% indoor. We had some pretty tight seating, and frankly, we found customers were still... Uh, uncomfortable being on top of each other as it was originally designed. So we took 24 seats out, I'm sorry, 20 seats out. And I think we added 24 seats to our patio. So yeah, we increased slightly at this point. Um, I can tell you as Mickey uh, expressed, I know the cove next to us and I know that across the street, there's another store, I think it's called Sunny's. Uh, both of them, those owners, I, I know pretty well. And they've both expressed that, uh, that business is up even though parking can be challenging, but, you know, frankly, you know, having myself grown up in Laguna beach and having another store in San Juan, parking is always a problem. 
it doesn't matter you know if we've taken 35 or 40 out of the equation you know those who want to find a parking space and want to make the effort can can usually do it um i didn't notice and again i've only been there since mid 2019 um but you know in our first winter in san juan we are in san clemente we noticed that uh it was pretty slow uh, there wasn't a whole lot going on especially midweek um downtown and uh Fast forward to 2020 winter, and in spite of uh, COVID situations, um, we did pretty well. And it was a blessing to have that out there. So I do think it, while it creates challenges parking-wise in the, in the busy months, um, it creates additional opportunity and revenue in what would normally be the slower months. Um, so I think it's something that has to be looked at uh, in its entirety. Um, as far as blocking, um, you know, other, other establishments and whatnot, I guess that is a concern. Um, ours is completely in front of ours, and, and I think most of them are. Um, but uh, as far as a uniform uh, look and feel, I think uh, uh, one of the things I don't like about Laguna's situation is they're all the same. And it, uh, I think it, it almost looks more like a, a park setting than it does have the personality reflected of the individual restaurants and what we're trying to... Uh, to convey to the customers, um, but it's it's been a huge success for us, and I don't know that that location, to be honest, would have survived had we uh, had the city not taken the steps they did for us. Thank you very much. Thanks, Carol. Um, and we're going to uh, stay in the um, sector of businesses or restaurants that are using public um, parking areas. So, Ms. Donatella, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and give your thoughts. You're still on mute. If you could unmute yourself at the bottom left corner of the screen, tap the microphone button. Can you hear me? Yes. Good evening, everybody, and thank you, Jonathan, for including me in this panel. Um, we opened five months ago, so in, I guess I don't know if there was a worse period to open, but we were, um, that's when the contractor finished, so that's what it was. Uh, the idea of the, of the outside patio has been great, maybe because we come from Italy, so it reminds us of all the cafes that we, in Italy we have on the street, and it gives a totally different feel also to clients. We did not include um, increase the number of seating. We basically transferred the inside table to the outside so we did not change the number of seats of the restaurant and we are totally in front of our own business. So I think it's, uh, I've spoken with several uh, customers and guests and they were all happy and people have this different atmosphere because it's uh, the weather is so nice and uh, people tend to really enjoy the idea of lingering maybe a little bit more outside than they would if they were just inside. And uh, with regard to parking, as uh, Kyle said before, it's always like that. The more, the, the more, that doesn't matter how much parking you have, there is always um, a request for more parking because restaurants are sprouting. There is always, there are more and more businesses opening and so more people are drawn to the city. So it's, uh, it's not only local people, but people from the outside. So the more the city offers, the more will attract other people. So it's a matter, I think, of balancing maybe the amount of space that is allow allotted to each restaurant, taking into consideration, of course, the neighbors of the restaurant, so that one that doesn't nothing happens like it happens to Mickey's being blocked. And also another thing to me very important is the appearance of these patios or parklets, because the city has must have a standard of not only safety, but also of aesthetics. So to make sure there is some sort of consistency among all the businesses and that there is a an outlook that's uh, maintained by everybody. But I think it's um, like, like it has happened in Laguna Beach, it has given to the city um, 
the possibility of staying outside, of I see more people just you know spending time, and um, and I think that's a that's a nice addition for everyone, and there will be a return not only for the restaurants involved, but also for the businesses that are close to the restaurants. So it's a, it's a matter of taking into consideration also the amount of space taken, the fact that. As uh, Mr. Crandall was not was concerned about the amount of people uh, or of restaurants increasing in uh, uh, number of customers, that can be easily checked and uh, and controlled as if it were just outside. And number three, um, the uh, the appearance and the respect of uh, all the people who are by the restaurants involved. That's my opinion. And of course, I agree. I just one thing: I we have not touched this um, aspect right now, but I think it's uh, it's going to be either sooner or I can do it now. I totally agree in the fact that we should pay the, for the use of the public space whenever, if you decide to go ahead with the program. It is normal that a business contributes to the city because we are using the space, which is everybody's space. Uh, the amount, that's something that there, there, must, there are criteria, obviously, to assess the amount. But um, of course, it must make economic sense. And another aspect, because what that's what I, yeah, I heard there was the possibility also of doing uh, maybe six months a year of the, patio area and six just during daylight saving and uh, that should that's I think is complicated because in in theory it's I understand it on in practice mounting and dismounting the patio is a big cost for the business and mm -hmm. also there is another issue where do we store this wood or whatever structure it is, if the, because the more we have to do something up to a standard, the more material will be involved. And so where are we going to store this during the other six months? It's not possible that one throws everything away or we have to rent a storage and, and the cost of disassembling and reassembling the space. Yeah, those are all and, questions we need to address. So I just want to, I don't know if it's the right moment, but I just wanted to point it out. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Donatella. And then last but certainly not least, uh, we have Steve Davis uh, representing Goody's Tavern. And Steve, I, I will give the caveat, is joining us from abroad, actually. So uh, some grace if, if his internet connection is not great. But uh, thanks, Steve, for taking the uh, time to join us and give your thoughts uh, from the perspective of someone who's using private uh, space. Uh, for a dining setup and, and also from the perspective of a business that um, is primarily operated as a bar, not a restaurant. Uh, hello. Good evening, everybody. Um, Jonathan, can you hear me? I can. Okay, good. Um, thank you for asking me to join this panel. Um, obviously, it's a big, big decision for everybody. Um, yes, the outdoor dining saved us through the pandemic, for sure. Um, and now, just because of our city and the climate, Obviously, it's a huge plus that people do want to be outside, whether they're dining or just drinking. It, it's it's very a big addition. And what Donatello was saying, they do linger a little longer because it's nice outside. They want to be outside. It's not in a crammed in area. Um, people are still very aware of being inside, being tight spaces. So um, from our end, it's it's a big positive. Um, yes, we do use our own parking spaces, um, which is a little different than you know taking the public ones. Um, but there's still some parking mitigation, obviously, situations. Um, but from our end, um, it's a positive. Um, I, I see that streamlining the pro application process, obviously, is something that's very enticing because some of that application process looks a little overwhelming. Um, but anyway, we're we are definitely all, all for it, and um, we'll try to help wherever we can. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. And then I'm going to give one uh, quick final comment uh, back to Mickey. Uh, just I know that we have several restaurateurs here um, and we had had a conversation previously about parking and it, it does 
have different effects on the biz different business types. So Mickey, if you want to give one more quick thought on that to finish up uh, with our, our participant panel. Sure, absolutely. I have uh, read a book. It's called The High Price of Free Parking. And the one thing, there was multiple things in it, but one thing that really struck me as interesting was consumer behavior. And that individuals who are looking to go to a restaurant um, because they're hungry, because they have a reservation, because they're meeting friends and family, will go to very great lengths to make sure that they make it uh, to get something to eat and to meet their friends which could involve multiple trips around the block, looking for parking spaces um, and making sure that they find a way to find a parking spot and then get to their restaurant. Um, they're willing to park further away from the establishment um, in order to achieve that goal of getting something to eat or making their reservation or joining their friends and family. Whereas retail shoppers don't have that same um, verve to make it, um, that they may think, oh, I want to pop by a shop and buy this or get that. And if they drive by once or twice and can't find a parking spot, they say, oh, I'll go another day or oh, maybe I'll go to this bigger box store that has better parking where I can also accomplish my goals. So as we're thinking about the idea of parking and that no matter how much parking we have, we're always gonna need more. I guess that's a good thing because we are a vibrant and wonderful town. It is something to consider the consumer behavior of different people and how people look at and view parking um, in any community. Okay, thank you very much. All good input. We appreciate uh, all the input we can get to make decisions on things like this. Um, Let's see, Adam, would you read in uh, any public comment uh, that you have received that needs to be addressed at this time? I will, Chair, thank you. All right, our first, our first public comment comes from Aaron Radman, um, and he writes, uh, let's see, this is um, yeah regarding Avila's El Ranchito. Uh, he writes, we are in favor of outdoor dining being permanent. I do believe that there should be some standards to how the deck areas should be constructed. One, level step off from curb. Two, color appropriate. Three, permanent build so it isn't uh, downgrading the surrounding businesses or downtown feel. Four, coverage options for weather change. Five, should be well lit so that oncoming traffic is aware of the space. Six, everyone should be cleaning up after their areas to prevent additional debris in our streets, uh, opening during and after hours. Seven, community has overwhelmingly expressed their, uh, quote, we hope this stays permanent, end quote, comments to us. Uh, hope this helps, and if needed, uh, I'm available to share any additional info, side note, uh, numerous of us have already spent seven to twelve thousand dollars on these decks already. The second comment uh, comes from Jeff Provence Jr. and he writes, uh, "Hello, my name is Jeffrey Provence Jr. I own Bloom's Irish Pub. I would like to voice my opinion in regards to the outdoor dining issue. I am in favor of extending outdoor dining at least until the state of emergency has been lifted. How can we even consider this to be a seasonal subject when COVID is still a problem? I am opposed to charging for patios on private property. Definitely opposed for a one-size-fits-all uh, charging for patios." How can you charge a business for spaces that are on private property and can be used as the property owner sees fit? The explanation received from uh, Jonathan Lightfoot regarding charges for parking was one, to help fund for the trolley. Uh, my business doesn't benefit from the trolley. It doesn't make stops at my end of town. So this is of no benefit to me. Uh, two, public parking. There is no public parking in our area. We cannot take spaces away from public parking if there are no spaces available. I can't rationalize paying more for using a parking spot on my property than I do for my business license. Every one of you ran campaigns stating you are going to be business friendly. Tell me how is this business friendly? This is a joke. 
Funding for the trolley system should be budgeted already. Adding this expense will not make the trolley system any better. Create funds to add police. We need more police in SC uh, to help with the increase in crime and to help with unruly drivers. Wouldn't you agree, Mr. James? City leaders need to talk to businesses, uh, business owners more often than election time. You may learn a few things. Uh, thank you. And the... Uh, the last comment uh, comes from Mickey Rathman. Uh, Mickey, since you're here, would you like me to continue to read your, your comments? Sure. I tried to not say some of the stuff I said in there already. Perfect. I didn't know I'd have the opportunity to also um, speak as a panelist. Okay. Thank you very much. And I will read that right now. Okay. Uh, Mickey writes, hello, the outdoor decks were important for our local restaurants when they were not allowed to service customers indoors. It was impressive how quickly the Downtown Business Association and city were able to get that program up and running during such a difficult time for our restaurants. In contemplating permanent outdoor dining, there is much more to consider. Uh, things like how much parking are we willing to give up? Can we expand the trolley service to South San Clemente? to help combat the loss of parking. The majority of our lodging is located in South San Clemente, um, who... Uh uh, who great who great would it be for out of town guests or excuse me how great would it be for out of town guests to take the trolley downtown can a, a restaurant's outdoor deck block neighboring businesses or will it only be allowed in front of the restaurant currently there are decks that block retail stores which is not fair to those businesses will decks be built with safety measures included will all decks be uniform and designed to maintain the quaint atmosphere of avenida del mar Will the restaurants with decks be required to be open certain number of days per week and hours per day uh, so that the streets retain it, is, its vibrant and active energy? Will restaurants still be allowed to have speakers and play music? What about inclement weather? Will the decks be allowed to have covers? Which, uh, which would block views of the street. While outdoor dining is popular, the current setup of the decks is not equitable for all of the businesses on Avenida Del Mar. Please keep in mind all of the businesses in the areas you are considering outdoor dining. Retail businesses can benefit from an outdoor dining program if done correctly. Thank you for considering the well being of all businesses as you work on this issue, Mickey Rathman, local business owner. And those are the comments that we had for. Uh, uh, to be read into the public record. Thank you, Adam, and thank you to uh, everyone who uh, showed up and made comments. Um, we will uh, open it up for discussion. Um, if any of the commissioners want to comment on it, anything, um, I've got one generality, uh, Jonathan, and I kind of alluded to it when I first spoke, but it seems we need to have a roadmap of not how we're going to change things, meaning codes and things in the general plan, but what we're trying to accomplish. Are we trying to just do this for pedestrian oriented areas in the city, which it seems like that's what it's promoting. It's promoting good traffic for the retail as well as the restaurants. Um, but what about destination restaurants that like Bloom's um, Molly Blooms that is kind of out on the end of town. It's a destination location. It's not a pedestrian location. So would they be treated the same? Or are we trying to get ordinance changes that affect the entire city? I mean, would uh, this affect businesses like uh, Artifacts and um, uh, Drift Distillery and all um, when it's not necessarily needed uh, per se? Um, and, and that the reason I kind of focused in on this is the document I found from um, uh, both Tampa and um, Park City both gave a program. This is what we want to accomplish. Um, and they taught they had titles like uh, types of public spaces used for this purpose. And it was outlined. And then we can address the code changes to accommodate that. But um, uh, what do you think about, uh, I mean, that's really the 10,000 foot um, kind of comments for you, I realize. But, uh, and I certainly welcome anything from other commissioners on just um, 
Uh, Commissioner uh, McCacken has some comments and uh, if anybody has any thoughts, we don't have to find solutions tonight, but we're really trying to identify problem areas if we see it, uh, what we do want to accomplish so uh, Jonathan can pursue those. Um, uh, Commissioner McCann, I see your speakers uh, unmuted. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, just my two cents, uh, along your lines, I had, I had written a note, where is this going to be available or applicable? Because um, I didn't really see that as being one of the, um, the, the potential changes. It didn't really say that. Um, and I agree, there's different considerations for different areas. Um, and my two cents, I think that, you know, the, the issues that have been identified here and by the panelists, I think are really good issues and thoughtful. I think a lot of thoughts gone into the issue identification and, you know, you're kind of on the right path, but the devil will be in the details of, of, of doing it. I mean, I think the good thing is that this is intended to, you know, formalize and extend what's already happening. So, you know, there is something currently going on and that can remain going on. Um, and so taking time to get it right doesn't impact the fact that people are already getting to enjoy the benefit of it. Uh, Jonathan, do you have any uh, uh, comment about, is this gonna be a blanket change for the whole city or is it uh, uh, overlay zones that happen to have a pedestrian oriented uh, um, route? Because that in our general plan, that's kind of what we're promoting pedestrian experience and which helps the retail as well as the restaurant. Um, and, but there are areas that just flat out are not pedestrian oriented uh, locations. Yeah, good question. Um, my my thinking on this, and, and again, this is part of why we're coming. You know, I'd love to get you know the commission's um, take on this. But uh, my initial thought would be that I, I do envision this to be citywide. I think there's definitely much um, stronger uh, pedestrian benefits in certain areas of the town, um, Del Mar and the Pier Bowl particularly, and, and we restricted. Um, the the use of these patios on El Camino Real, for instance, because of concerns about uh, roadway traffic. Uh, so that's why you don't see any parklets uh, on the street on El Camino Real. Um, however, we had uh, there was a universal interest for a lot for understandable COVID reasons initially, but I think that now that we um, have moved into a place where indoor dining is um, you know permitted and and um, returning to normal. Uh, there, there is still, uh, I'm hearing from both, um, I'll, I'll say the pedestrian and the destination restaurants an interest in maintaining the additional exterior spaces. So as, as the commission, I think one of the things you can look at is, you know, is there value beyond just the walkable areas and expanding um, outdoor experiences for customers in San Clemente? Um, and and I, my initial take is I think that there is benefit to looking at an expansion opportunity of the program citywide. Our code already does distinguish between outdoor dining that uses public spaces and private. And so I think that we can maintain that distinguishing element um, and, and build in what you think would be appropriate in those different areas in that avenue. Uh, that's just my, my initial take. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Commissioner Prescott. First of all, I wanted to thank all of the businesses that have weathered COVID. Um, you're my heroes, each and every one of you. Uh, without you, it wouldn't feel normal. And it didn't feel normal for a long time until your doors opened. So I really appreciate all the time, effort, trouble, and expense you all went to to uh, serve a good meal or um, open up your shop doors. And it felt good. My husband and I were down there quite often. and it just, it just felt real good. So I really appreciate, appreciate that. Um, I've made a couple of notes and uh, I agree with the fairness. And I think we need to have a set of guidelines and, and I would like to see some, some ideas that came to mind is the uniformity, uh, better materials and more consistent materials, uh, winterizing with acceptable heating elements that are safe, um, the blocking, the height, 
no one should block another business. That, that goes to fairness, the aesthetics, uh, uniform and lighting. So that if, so it doesn't look temporary. Uh, if we're gonna go forward with this on a more permanent basis, then we need to have a list of acceptable materials versus a list of discouraged materials. I don't know if there would be a mandate. I hate the word mandate, but uh, I would like to see uh, possible guidelines in that area uh, with materials, co uh, colors, you know, um, umbrellas versus tarps uh, so that, you know, it is more inviting. And as the flu season hits, I think we're gonna see more outdoor dining again. Um, I do wanna address the parking. Uh, fairness again to the businesses that are not restaurants, um, but I do think restaurants are going to still struggle going forward. I hope not, but I, I would like to prepare for our city to, uh, as a just in case. So I was looking at why we were, we were going over this. I was looking at Santa Barbara, which has even a list and diagrams for ADA ramping to um, access, be for accessible on the curb. And it actually has a diagram. It looks pretty good and pretty well thought out. So I probably will submit this copy and we can take a look at that. What would you like to see from us tonight? Is that Jonathan or Adam or the businesses? What can we do to move this along and get it to the next step? Those comments are um, right in line with what is helpful. So anything that, uh, uh, explains your vision of what a good outdoor dining program would be. And, and then um, that gives me the ability to dive into the weeds with things, um, Commissioner Prescott Leffler, as you just mentioned with ADA standards, et cetera. And I can uh, compile those elements and bring them back in, a, in more of a written form um, that then we can uh, work through and edit uh, at the next meeting. So this was gonna be something that there'll probably be um, two or three sessions with the commission to work through. So at this point, getting your vision of what a good program would be is the most helpful. And I would like to hear more about the fees, the public uh, space versus the private space. Uh, is it the same fee or, or the, has the fee yet to be determined? What does that look like? Again, as far as fairness. Sure. So uh, we have a, a fee that applies, again, only to the temporary program um, that was implemented um, after about a year of operations. Uh, and the fee is uh, $200 per parking space per month for spaces in the public um, right of way. And it's 100 uh, uh, per month for spaces that are on private property. And um, the, the thought there was uh, tied to the June 15th timeframe where the state removed the capacity restrictions. And so recognizing that there was a shift from the original intent and that there were parking impacts, uh, the council thought it was appropriate to implement that fee. There's not an expectation for that particular fee to remain in place, uh, but their initial thinking was that it uh, was logical to charge a little bit more uh, for use of public areas than for private areas, uh, and that those funds should be uh, attributed towards improving mobility uh, options. And I have a question about the, thank you for, for explaining that. I have a question about the public space. Since the public space is being extended to the restaurant, it still remains a public space. So how do, you know, how is it open to all public and yet it belongs to a restaurant for that specific time? How, how do we work that? Sure, good question. Um, so, you know, the city can, uh, to, I'm going to take a, a broader view than a parking space. Obviously, the city has lease agreements or operating agreements for different um, public spaces uh, throughout the city. Um, this current setup is a very unique situation because normally we would not be entering into this conversation without uh, coastal approval, et cetera. Um, and as I hinted at initially, um, in order to arrive at a coastal approval for a permanent program, we're likely going to need to demonstrate that we are 
um, offsetting um, parking impacts by providing expanded mobility. And our way of doing that would be through charging a fee for certain spaces. Uh, different cities have handled this differently. I referenced the San Francisco program earlier, and they do require that there at least be a bench within any parklet area that is open to any member of the public, not necessarily a patron. So some cities do tie in a caveat um, that requires uh, some form of uh, public access. I just wanted to make sure maybe uh, uh, Mel can answer this as far as the legal side as a public space being extended to a business uh, you know, as long as it's still available to the public, how would that look? Yeah, it's it's a good question. It's it's somewhat complicated. These these issues were worked through during during the lockdown and then the pandemic when this when this issue was first first dealt with. But there are um, uh, agreements entered into and and temper there there have been temporary permits issued for these spaces um, because it is public space. The public or the the city is is able to deal with that in different ways, including allow for a restaurant or private a private business to use that that public space, just like it, it can um, give a permit or even lease out portions of parks or other public spaces for private events. So it's the same same kind of issue. There are insurance requirements, uh, defense requirements, uh, but it is possible. But there are hoops to jump through. Okay, thank you. Those are just my observations um, and questions, insights. And again, you're all my heroes. So uh, we're here to support you as much as, as much as we possibly can. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Prescott. Uh, Commissioner Camp. Yeah, I'd like to say too, thanks to the business owners. Um, we've enjoyed, you know, especially during the pandemic um, and primarily on Del Mar, but I, I do agree with uh, Chair Crandall that, you know, we need, we really need some direction in terms of what, what is the city's intention with this ordinance? Because, you know, we're looking at something that was a sort of a stopgap measure um, in terms of allowing parking or not parking, allowing um, these parklets um, on, on public property and now you're saying that this is this is something that's going to be permanent. So, you know, I believe that it, it should be available to anyone in the city, but that each location needs to be looked at independently. And I think that there should be an opportunity, like a lot of, let's say a lot of great cities in Europe, where there's plazas and town centers that are available to all the restaurants, let's say all the restaurants within a given block. Um, that, and I'm not sure how you do that um, on Del Mar because you've got a street that's active with vehicles running right down the middle. But I think there are there is a potential, especially a long-term potential of creating some plazas, some mini plazas in these areas that can be used by multiple um, establishments. And so I think that's something that should definitely be looked at. Um, certainly the businesses on Del Mar stand to gain the most. I think that's where most of the parking or the, the public parking is located. Is that right, Jonathan? Just real quick. Yeah. Uh, so there's obviously a good amount of parking, not just on street in Del Mar, but some uh, parking, public parking access spots um, on either side, Granada and Cabrillo. Um, we have, I, I believe it's in the range of um, 300 parking spots um, in that circle. Uh, and we are using um, about 20% of the on street Del Mar parking currently. Um, so that's not 20% of 300, that's just 20% of the on Del Mar uh, parking at this point. Okay, so parking district, has that been considered in terms of, you talked about fees, um, we're gonna be collecting fees for the trolley. I understand we're trying to promote uh, pedestrian use and you know, you know, access other than with vehicles. Um, and that's been successful in a lot of cities. I know they did that, they've done that uh, throughout California, San Luis Obispo is a good, um, a good instance where that's that's occurred and that's very 
you know, it's been very successful. Same thing in Santa Barbara. Um, so that's something, I don't know if you've considered that, but I think it should be considered. Um, do tenants have a choice? I mean, there was, there was a couple of comments, I think, that were read that implied that a business owner has the right to use his on-site parking for whatever he wants. And that's actually not true. I mean, if it's, if it's designated parking to allow for the use of that restaurant, um, then there needs to be some sort of a trade-off, um, even if that's on park, uh, private property. So that definitely needs to be considered because for instance, we've talked to the owners of the vine and they have a huge, I don't know if it's still there, but they've had, a, they have a huge tent and they've said it's basically not sustainable because of the size of their kitchen um, and, you know, just the ability to serve that many people. I mean, the kitchen's primarily it. So that obviously has to come into play. And really, I think that though we want to streamline this process, you know, there needs to be some sort of a conditional, I hate to say CUP because that's very daunting, but every business is going to be different. I think there needs to be guidelines that are established that we use as a criteria, almost like our historic um, study session that we had today, but that we need to look at each location individually and see how you're going to get, you know, handicap access, see how you're going to get adequate lighting, see how it's going to be equitable. Most of these things have already been mentioned. I think there's been some great comments um, and suggestions that have come up tonight. I think that it's potentially a good idea to look at specific areas and try and come up with guidelines that match those areas as opposed to just blanket guidelines that wouldn't necessarily um, apply to, the, to a lot of areas in the city. Um, so those are some of the key things I talked about. Uh, our fees. How are the fees? One of the comments seemed to imply that this business owner was going to get assessed a fee, even though it, he doesn't benefit from the trolley. So I don't really understand if that's an if that's an appropriate comment. Our our businesses somehow being assessed fees, even if they don't have access to these parklets or aren't able to use the trolley. So that needs to be considered as well. So those are kind of the main, some of the main things that I had. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Commissioner Camp. Um, do we have, uh, Commissioner McCacken, I see you're unmuted. I've, I've already made my comments, but one thing I didn't mention was if we are renting these spaces or whatever we're doing leasing, what's the clawback? There's gonna need to be some clawback because there needs to be no question that if the city needs that, Parking space again for parking, the program's over. Right? So the current program um, does have, uh, essentially the city is able to um, terminate an agreement at any point. And we, we have to, we do give a, a brief period of notice I don't have the agreement in front of me. I believe it's like 10 days, something of that sort uh, within these operating agreements currently. Uh, so it's not an indefinite approval. And, and I would agree that yes, for public spaces like that, we would need to continue to use some form of clause where the city is able to regain that space quickly if, if needed for some reason. You know, my, and my only other thought is, and this, this is just a Disneyland thought, is this whole discussion really brings back, which has continually been a problem as I look back in the history, you really need a parking structure. <laughs> but, you know, that's some later date. But in other cities where I've been, in order to increase, you know, the traffic and bring in a movie theater and that kind of thing, we eventually did build a four-story parking structure that was free. And that made a world of difference in, you know, you made one loop, and if you know you couldn't find a parking spot, you know, it, it, you just went right into the parking structure. So everybody won, whether you were a restaurant or whether you were a, you know, non-food um, business. But that's a longer story farther out. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I don't see anybody uh, else's light. Or, yes. Oh, there you go, uh, Commissioner McCann. Just real quick, sorry for interrupting again. 
I've heard a couple of the fellow commissioners seemingly just express interest on, well, we want to understand better the purpose, what's trying to be achieved here. And my, my impression is that council has kind of said, we want this to happen now, make it happen and dig through the, dig through the, through the details and think of, through all the thoughts of what needs to happen, but they want to see it happen. That's my impression. I guess I would ask Adam or Jonathan, is that accurate? Yeah, yes, that's accurate. And I want to give a, a quick um, contextual piece of information. So at one point, we, we also looked at an opportunity um, for converting Avenue Del Mar to one way. Um, and uh, ultimately, that wasn't going to be something that would be functional because we communicated um, that potential plan to Orange County Fire, and they're going to still require a 20 foot right of way. So we really weren't going to gain any additional space there through that consideration with council. However, there was a, a number of comments from uh, past council members and commissioners that uh, said that they felt that um, these considerations of design and a new program should go through planning commission first and get the, uh, the thoughts and design input from this body before going to council. And while council uh, essentially said, thank you, no, not for the COVID specific program because we wanna be very nimble, we do, we hear you and we want this program to go through that filter uh, and get the design recommendations um, from the planning commission body, since this is your area of expertise, the public realm and design before coming back to us uh, as a permanent program option. So there were public comments at council meetings in the past that uh, urged them to really draw on your uh, expertise. And, and so that is uh, a part of, again, why we're, we're uh, moving this direction. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, Commissioner O'Connor, I want to make one comment before I call on you. Um, I've always been of the opinion. No, I don't that, want to do it. Oh, I've always been of the opinion. We are the planning commission and we work at the um, city council's um, blessing. They've appointed us and it's up to us to give our best assessment of land use issues that we can, whether it's against or for um, what they've suggested. So I think we need to look at it as um, we're gonna make the best comments we can regarding land use and how it's used and what we see as the best in the planning thing. And then uh, they can override us. Uh, we, we are not the final say, we're just giving them the best input we possibly can. Um, and uh, I have yet to have a, a city councilman complain that we didn't give them the best um, effort we uh, could on uh, making the right decision. Um, I see uh, Commissioner Prescott, you are unmuted. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to uh, follow up with uh, Scott's uh, observation. Uh, I'm very comfortable with uh, developing some guidelines, looking at this further. I just want to know how the commission, what does that look like going forward since there seems to be somewhat of a timeline? Is it done through this commission publicly? Do we need to do it at an ad hoc committee? What is acceptable to develop these guidelines? Or should we have a motion to develop the guidelines? Looking for some direction. Well, we're making recommendations, so we can certainly make that one of the recommendations um, uh, and make sure that goes to Jonathan and then through to uh, the next reviewing body or directly from our minutes to um, city council because they'll have a record of minutes um, of tonight. Okay, so so our, there is an actual, well, I understand the minutes are the record, but is there a specific list out of these minutes that will be headed to city council of our observations? Jonathan? No, so uh, the intent of this meeting is for um, staff to gather the feedback uh, and then craft an initial um, guideline set uh, or, or uh, as I mentioned before, redline or existing zoning ordinance and bring that back for your consideration. I do think that uh, that could be a consideration, uh, Commissioner Prescott Leffler, um, uh, because there are a lot of details at play. Uh, this commission certainly could look at 
uh, and ad hoc to dive a little bit deeper into some of those uh, should you wish, if that's a, a route that you think you'd be most able to, um, you know, grasp the different elements of, um, of this topic and, and provide good feedback. Thank you. It's um, it, like someone said, uh, the uh, devil is in the details. And I would like to have staff be able to read back our, our thoughts or recommendations that we had tonight. Now, maybe you can't do it tonight because you, you have to put that together. But I would like to make sure that everybody had an opportunity to provide their thoughts, their assessment of this, so that we have something to work, a working document. And then from there, take it to the next step. Yeah, I, I, I'm kind of the feeling that I, I agree with um, Commissioner Prescott a little bit that uh, this is the first time we've had a chance to look at this, comment on it. And uh, we're gonna sleep on this a number of nights and think about solutions and whatnot and concerns about roofs blocking, signage for businesses, et cetera, all these details. And um, uh, I would be certainly happy to see this come back probably sooner than later. Um, so we can um, uh, restate these concerns we have tonight and new ones we uh, come up with quite quickly. So I don't know if that's possible, Adam. You uh, know our schedule either in a study session or an agendized item um, or a, uh, what do we have, new business um, uh, meeting like this where uh, we have an opportunity to view our, our um, thoughts. If we could develop our thoughts and put it in a framework yeah. and then be able to present it to the city council. That, that's exactly what I meant by a roadmap of uh, how we get to the final solution or what is the final solution we're going for, correct? Yeah, uh, so uh, Chair uh, Crandall and uh, Planning Commissioners, uh, you know, the, the intent, I think, of this first introduction was just to uh, bring this to light as something that the commission would be delving into and based on first impressions, um, we wanted to get kind of a sense of what were the, I'll say the overarching topics or concerns um, or, or any desires that the commission might have. Now there's been a lot of uh, particular topics raised. Um, what I'll say is I think at this point, the, the, a, a good next step would be uh, probably a preliminary review of um, of staffs, I'll call it uh, a working draft, um, and I'll I'll use an example of one of the topics raised and, and why I think this 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 meeting is is so beneficial. Um, uh, Commissioner Prescott mentioned um, a number of items uh, that should be taken into consideration in this type of ordinance. One of them was high quality materials. Um, you know, that, that bringing that topic up tells staff that that's going to be something important for any long-term program. Uh, staff is capable of, of identifying a, um, we'll call it a menu of typical high quality um, uh, materials uh, because this is something that we deal with uh, in development projects uh, throughout the city. So instead of having like a, a you know an ad, ad, hoc, ad hoc committee to sit down and talk about high quality materials, staff has a lot of, of we have a lot of, of information on this already. So let us compile that, present it back to the commission in, in more of a, a, a finalized way. And at that time, you know, the, the, the commission will um, you know, be able to, to dive into that particular issue. Along with that one topic, we would have a proposal for, you know, for, for every impact or concern that has been raised tonight. What we wanted to, what we wanted to really get at was what, what is the universe of, of, of things that the commission believes are going to be required in an ordinance 
uh, to allow this program to exist. And I'll put it, I'll say on a longer term basis. There's been some discussion about um, about how long, long that, you know, how long is permanent. Um, that's a great, that's a great, you know, that's a great um, a call by the commission to identify that, you know, this, in some situations, maybe there's a better opportunity for permanence than there is in other situations. That's something staff's going to look at. So we, we, were, we want to gain this initial feedback um, because we don't want to come to the commission with a draft ordinance that is um, deficient in a, in a number of, of, of categories. We want to provide something that's robust, um, um, but you know, provides a path for businesses to offer outdoor dining in as streamlined a way as possible. Um, Jonathan did a great job of, of presenting the, the pitfalls of an overly regulated um, uh, permitting process. And so there's a balance that we're, we're looking for here. And, and this initial discussion about concerns, impacts, and wants, I think is, is absolutely perfect uh, for this time. I would recommend that we uh, staff come back with a... Um, I'll say a working draft um, and uh, me and Jonathan will, will work on um, when that can be uh, provided. And I will say, I do understand the concern about wanting to be read back all of the, um, the concerns that were brought up. Jonathan and I will, um, we've been taking notes, but we will be reviewing this video um, uh, in depth again later uh, to make sure that we do touch on all of the um, the, uh, the points that have been raised tonight. Okay, and I think one thing we haven't touched on is how many outdoor dining spaces does each restaurant get? What's it based on? What's the limit? Is there a maximum that anybody can have of X? Um, and that's gonna be um, a real big concern. I mean, can they take up three parking spaces or do they, can they take up seven? And um, it shouldn't be random. It should be somehow fixed to people's business um, and make sure it doesn't go beyond or in front of uh, retailers. Um, they're just as important as our restaurants. Um, so that's something that has to be addressed. Uh, Commissioner Kacken. I'm sorry. Well, I was going to say, Adam kind of took a lot of my fire away from me. Um, I was going to say, you know, my comments are in this meeting record. And uh, so there's a visual, you know, an audio comment of what, you know, I've said are the comments. And, I, and it's sort of explicit in this memo that, you know, it, it's gonna go back to staff, they're gonna come back to us. And they're really, their rubber doesn't meet the road until it comes back to us. And then once we're done with it, it'll go to the council. So I think there's plenty of time for both the public, you know, and the commissioners to get you know, their comments in there, but this I think is really just the first unofficial pass. So I'm in favor of just letting it go back to staff. They don't need to have any further, you know, kind of feedback to us, except we'll look in the minutes. I'll look in the minutes to make sure that my comments, you know, are in there and that'll be my assurance that they understood my comments, that it's gonna be reflected in the minutes. Very good. And Thank then you. let the process go forward. Good. Uh, Commissioner Prescott. Yes, can uh, Adam, can you also include, uh, I did bring up the ADA, but since this is going to be permanent in nature, I would imagine that the outdoor site would be similar to the indoor site, which would require, I don't know, certain table heights, definitely uh, some sort of ramping to, um, it, it, again, to just check all those boxes. And so could you just take a look at what the, the code requirement would be for ADA? It, it possibly is already being addressed now. No, that is something staff uh, would take into consideration. Uh, but again, um, uh, noting your concerns, we will make it uh, explicit how the any draft ordinance addresses those issues. And building department, when they plan check these things, will make sure it is ADA accessible, et cetera. So that is taken care of. Um, do I see anyone else? I see uh, Commissioner McCann's mic is unmuted. 
Yeah, just real quick, it might be helpful for staff or maybe staff's already done this, but to go around and kind of informally survey, um, you know, what's, what's, what's been built out there and what's working and, and what are challenges um, because we talk about number of parking spaces and, and so forth, and maybe we have these concerns, but in, in, in practice, in reality, they're less of an issue than, than we think they are. So that's just a suggestion. Okay, very good. Um, I don't see anyone's mic, mics on, so I think staff has um, the directions they need. Uh, so I will close the new business um, section, and we will open old business, and we have none. Reports of commissioners and staff. Does the staff have any reports um, to mention? Yes, I have two items uh, that I'd like to go over. The first is um, uh, we were talking about the certified local government uh, status uh, of San Clemente in our study session today. Um, I will be forwarding the commission some information on some trainings. They're, uh, they're free to us. Um, and they're virtual uh, related to uh, CLG status. Uh, th taking those trainings helps us maintain our, our status. Uh, so we, uh, tomorrow I will have uh, some staff send that to you and I encourage everyone to take it. Uh, and then the second item is um, that staff is working on moving, uh, moving uh, meetings to, uh, to be in person. And we are looking at uh, doing this for the planning commission um, as soon as possible. Uh, the, um, the planning commission's meetings uh, would require a similar setup to what the city council has now in terms of broadcasting and availability for the public. Um, uh, unfortunately, the, um, the community center is, uh, is, has a reservation uh, for the, the next planning commission's Wednesday meeting, and there are no other city facilities available um, at this time for that meeting. So the next one will be via teleconference. However, the, the, as, soon as, we're, as soon as staff is capable, uh, we will be moving these meetings uh, to in-person. Now with in-person, I mean at that combination Zoom and uh, uh, public availability for, for attendance. Um, so those are, my two, uh, those are my two comments for tonight and I will wrap up uh, at that point. Very good, thank you very much. Um, so uh, we will close reports of commissioners and staff and open it up for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Okay, we will be adjourning to the next regular meeting of the study session and planning commission will be held on October 6, 2021 at 6 p.m. via teleconference. Do we have a second of Commissioner Prescott's motion? I'll second. Who is that? Second. McCacken. Um, McCacken, thank you. I, I didn't see you there. Um, so we have a motion by Prescott, second by McCacken. Um, a roll vote, uh, Commissioner McCann. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Camp. Aye. Commissioner Prescott. Aye. Uh, did we Aye. Did we lose something? Oh, uh, my screen's messed up. Uh, Commissioner McCacken is an aye, and Commissioner Crandall is an aye. It passes five to two. Um, so a, a good conversation. That's a, a complicated item to uh, deal with. There's going to be a lot we have to uh, solve. So thank you very much, everybody. And good public input. Good yeah. public input. Thank you, everyone. Very good public input.